We're starting with the first uh, panel, personal not science as a critical concept for informed resistance and reform. We're starting with uh, Deepa Anuita Dasgupta. I think you are at the University of uh, Texas, Texas El Paso. right in Houston. Yeah. No, El Paso, sorry. El Paso. Yeah. Okay, and I Not Houston, floor. not yet. <laughs> so does this, this mic work? Okay. So, um, my habit is generally to stand rather than sit down and talk, so I'll try to do that. So I'll start with a um, personal observation. I got into this business about the scientific goals about two years back, and then almost by accident, I wandered into conversation with a group of chemistry faculty in my home department. So everything follows is a kind of conversation among a small group. So the first thing, the way it came to me, is that what is going to be the goals and purpose of scientific practice in the 21st century? We cannot say that the war or colonization are going to be great goals because almost every country now has a scientific community. Those things will just set everything on fire, so that's not a good goal. We can say that, of course, the goal should be truth or maybe problem solving, but even then, there are lots of trivial truths that nobody wants. So by following Philip Kitcher, I'll say that our goal could be significant truths. And then the question is, how do you get those significant truths? How do you design a scientific community which has the maximum number of significant truths? So do you, everyone hears me to the last row? Is it? Okay. So this is where I started um, talking with my group of chemistry faculty. And uh, they came and gave talks in my philosophy of science seminar and I went to their professional colloquium. And it seems that conversation in science, just as on the note that we ended, is very much dominated by a number of terms. One of these terms is diversity and inclusion. I'll never get as far as inclusion, but I'll talk about diversity. And I also found that contrary to the common knowledge, most professional scientists actually have very complex philosophical views. They use it. It's just that they are not aware of it. So that's where a philosopher can come in. So one of the goals of modern scientific community seems to be that let's make science more diverse. We can say that an optimal scientific community should be as diverse as possible, but how are we supposed to think of this diversity? And here I use a little philosophical thing. So think of all significant problems in science as a landscape. It is an epistemic landscape. This approach was used by Westberg and Muldrin in 2000 line. Now the question is, how is it this landscape explored the best? Clearly, if some people climbs up on the top of the mountain, yeah, and some stays in the front or some goes in the back, then the landscape will be nicely explored. So we need division of labor, we need cognitive division of labor, and that means diversity and so forth and so good. But at this point, I noticed a very strange problem that whenever scientists talk of diversity, they mostly mean statistical diversity. That means let's recruit some minority students, throw them in the scientific workforce, and by the time they come out, we will have diverse ethnic backgrounds diverse thoughts and diverse solutions. And that is precisely where the program actually goes wrong. Because here is what will happen. When you recruit the minority students, they will not immediately become scientists. You will give them 14 to 15 years of training. And with that training, you will basically ground out all the diversity that exists today on the first day. So you are basically making clones of modern scientists out of diverse material. And this is diversity, yes, but in a very skin deep sense. And I'll give an example. That was my post-colonial example. Here is the thing I think everyone knows, the Army Museum in Paris. If you go to this wonderful building, which I have been going last two years, you will see from the top to bottom, they have all the museum employees are from West Africa, the former imperial positions. And they will give you as much Napoleon and Charles de Gaulle and Henry IV as you want. But when I talk to them, do you remember your culture? Do your children remember your language? They say, no, no. So what you are creating is a basic clones of a common imperial pattern. And this has been done all over the world. This has been done in the British Empire, French Empire, 
So in the name of diversity, it is this imperial game all over the world. It's as the French say, the more it changes, the more it is the same. And here is, I remember that diversity is usually biologist game. I've never heard of any physicist talk of diversity. And Darwin's diversity was, here is the mainland finch, gives rise to island finch, but now we are doing the reverse. We are taking the various island finch and grinding them down to the mainstream finch. This is not diversity, so how do we create it? So um, we got a little group together at El Paso, and some of the things that we talk about if we are going to create a richer concept of diversity, what is the way, what is the program, what are the going to be the little things that we should do? And here seems to be some of the things we could do. One is we could do to those places where standard, very resource heavy science has almost nothing to offer. Because if you have lots of money, lots of equipment, lots of grants, that science operates within the laboratory in a very resource rich, expensive setup. So I'll give you two quick examples. This guy is not from El Paso. He's a young biophysics professor at Stanford. His name is Manu Prakash. And there you see a fully functional microscope made out of folded paper. It is called Foldscope. It costs about two bucks. Its virtue is you can carry it to the line of care to places where there is no electricity, there is no skilled workforce, and you can still see a malaria parasite. So you can detect the infectious diseases. Here is the quick second thing. Um, this is a centrifuge, they call it paperfuge, and the, the idea of this came to the scientist when he saw in Uganda a paper, a costly centrifuge being used as a door stopper. And this is, this is, well, this is very, 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 very well known. Most of the developing countries buy a lot of instrument. Very soon the buildings turn into instrument graveyard. So what he looked for, something that will work, this is the world's oldest toy. It is a spinning toy. But if you can spin it right, you should be able to get about 10,000 RPM per minute. So it will separate plasma and blood, and you can detect anemia. So this is one place where you could go. You could develop these very frugal tools that can operate in condition where there is no electricity, where do not need expensive parts, one diversity. Number two, science has a terrible relationship with most traditional knowledge. And it is very well attested in most colonial contexts that whenever you have a society developing itself according to science, all the traditional knowledge, there is the healthcare, everything goes out, it just dies. So one of our colleagues at the University of El Paso, what you have before you is called the Maya blue. Maya blue is a legendary blue color that the Maya civilization had. And the wonderful thing is it never fades. 900 years later, it is still beautiful blue. So they wanted to know the secret of how this thing stays blue in tropical condition under environmental degradation because the scientists are looking for non-toxic paint. That is one of the greatest game, non-toxic materials and paints. Most paints are very toxic. They use heavy metals. So what they did, they found that Maya Blue is made of two things. This is the chemist who developed it, is one of per person of my group. So it is made of two things. One is the organic dye indigo. Very well known thing. You still use genes, color, indigo for coloring genes. And then there is a little white clay called paligorskite. So it has channels. So when you hit the two things together, you mix the clay with indigo, hit them together, it gradually changes color. These are their slides. I just borrowed them for the conference. So on the right hand side, you see the X-ray diffraction spectra. So this is coming pretty close to the Maya blue. So what they did, what they managed to do under laboratory condition is to create a structural equivalent of Maya Blue. It works, they have founded a little company, but what is most important, they found that Maya Blue is actually a case of indigenous nanotechnology because this is where the indigo goes in the channels and it forms surface complexes. It forms an organic inorganic hybrid and once you understand how they were doing it, now we can do many other things that they did not do. So strangely, reviving a little secret 
it can open a new portal to knowledge. So you bring back the traditional technology, the lost technology, and it gives you a leg up. So it preserves the knowledge. Number three, this is one of the, our chemists. His passion is to create um, what he calls innovation-driven discovery. That means you take some of the worst problems of the world, and his specialty is water, and you design these biomass-derived water filters. This one is basically tea waste. So tea waste is here. It cleans water of methylene blue. It can create the worst poison of form of chromium, tetracycline, the antibiotics. So this is the idea is that it can be scaled down. You can use all kinds of available materials. So this is one more way of diversity. Last, quickly, I want to say the, what you have before you is rice cultivation in Indonesia, Bali. <clears throat> rice is a very water-intensive cultivation. It needs to be submerged, half submerged in water for about six to eight weeks. So that means the farmers must share water. And someone must solve the water disputes. Now, the traditional way they have solved it is they think that there is a theoretical system of well-being between the heaven, earth, and human beings. And you see that little temple over there? That's a water temple presided by God. So God takes care of the system. Now, God should not have bothered Newton. But gods are very troublesome for modern ontology because it's just not part of modern science anymore. But it turns out that this God-managed water work actually works far better than modern chemical intensive agriculture. So you might want to keep these things in place instead of taking out because they too are observable, public, replicable, and measurable, just like modern science. So it's not the same technology, not the same ontology, but you could cooperate with a different kind of epistemic order to create these outcomes. This is a happy conclusion, because this was not wiped out. This was recognized, this, this is called Subak system. So Subak system was recognized by UNESCO in 2012. That means it will continue to look after the rice fields. So these are the quick four examples I have. One is you could do go to the areas where most resource-heavy, lab-bound science does nothing to offer. You could form trading zones with different epistemic partners. You can create epistemic alliance with the traditional systems of knowledge. You can do innovation discovery, and you can do perhaps much more. So once this is done, perhaps we have at least the beginning of some kind of a diverse science. And it will be a diversity in research programs, diversity in training, diversity in different kind of people. What I think we should try to avoid, most scientists, there was some talk about a workforce that has no security. And we are, I call it a bees in a beehive model. So most scientists today are being reduced to bees in a beehive. So they have to produce honey, otherwise there will be, they will be kicked out. But that also means that you are just a line worker, you are not a scientist anymore. The whole epistemic primacy is going, passing away. So it, this is a project, it's not a, just a philosophy project. Even scientists should be interested in it because their future depends on it. And certainly the students should be interested on it. And um, here is the last slide, repairing a boat at sea. This is the classic logical positivism, Otto Neurath. So if you are repairing a boat at sea, you can let the boat sink. You'll have to do it piece by piece, piece by piece. Man. So we are writing a grand proposal. We have some scientists who are interested in philosophy. What we now need, some philosopher and theorist of science who are interested in talking to the scientists. They have complex views, but they don't dwell on it. And uh, here is my group. This is the Maya Blue, Professor Ras Kinelli. This is the water person, Dr. Navaran. So this is more or less we talk about. I have one or two um, uh, geoscientists because you want to go to the science of the big, a couple of physicists. Somehow I ended up with a bunch of chemists, but chemists are interesting people because they are descendant of the alchemist because all they do is to turn one thing into another thing. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope I finished in time.
Thank you very much. So I've been told you cannot ask any question right now. Uh, that, well, that's what Andrea said. Okay, brilliant. So, uh, but thank you very much. Uh, we'll now listen to Anibale Bigheri. Where are you? Okay. From the University of Firenze, uh, talking about. <laughs> are you not from Firenze? Okay, talking yes, about thank you. environmental epidemiology. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm professor of medical statistics and uh, I worked on uh, epidemiology and especially environmental epidemiology. So my talk with, in some sense, be more reductionist in terms and, and address the question of reproducibility, which is going on the table uh, recently in, uh, in our uh, community after some decisions of the Environmental Protection Agency regarding the way to uh, restructure the process of acquisition of knowledge, scientific knowledge, to support uh, regulations. Uh, the debate started on April uh, when the administrator of EPA, Scott Pruitt, signed a proposed rule to strengthen science. Uh, it is strange to note that an administrator is discussing the, the rule to uh, enforce the science used in uh, regulations. And uh, the motivation he uh, used was uh, the uh, so-called replication crisis uh, in, uh, in science. And they said a significant proportion of published research may not be reproducible. This is interesting, but what's the action of this? Just uh, change <coughs> the, uh, the composition of a clean air scientific advisory committee, changing the members, putting as uh, uh, chairman uh, Louis Cox, who said uh, that uh, the commission must uh, to return to its original scientific mission, to return to its original scientific mission. It may help restore, restore scientific integrity and political accountability. So with our valueful <laughs> language, not scientific, it's, it's a bit strange. And the motivation is even more astonishing. This because in the past, its members have strayed from their mandate to advise on scientific questions and become vociferous advocates for or opponents of certain policies. So, of course, a lot of debate came, and uh, Naomi Oreskes from Merchant of Doubts <laughs> is thinking of Merchant of uh, Replicability. And uh, in the correspondence, uh, Andrea Saltelli already mentioned the U.S. National Association of Scholars, a uh, uh, comment saying the rule is a justified response to the irreproducibility crisis and reinforces the U.S. government's long-standing commitment to base policy on the best available science. I will end with some uh, statements about what is the best available science. But on the other side, uh, broaden the horizon. What is going on? WHO, uh, World Health Organization in 2014, uh, through the Agency of Research on Cancer, classified outdoor air pollution as carcinogen to humans. Environmental epidemiologists therefore answered to Scott Pruitt of EPA, uh, addressing technical issues about valid study design and proper statistical analysis following this 
causal approach which is mainstream today. But four years later, 2018, just a few days ago, the uh, head of WHO claimed that air pollution is the new tobacco. Again, it's a word which is not scientific. We are speaking <laughs> in a completely different way. Uh, air pollution is the new tobacco is the title in The Guardian not in the report of the WHO conference held on the last days of October in Geneva. And the environmental epidemiologists what are doing in this, changing, not study design, not statistical analysis, something different, impact estimates and projections who are based on uh, unverifiable assumption. There uh, is a, a shift out, outside science. Uh, what is good for science? There is a, a, a nuclear physics, uh, Bailey, put the question, is replicability good for science? And he, he said, not, not at all. Different teams studying the same phenomenon can often produce widely different results. But this is a sign of healthy scientific progress. So where is the, the problem? Uh, I briefly uh, wanted to cover these um, points. Uh, the extent of the phenomenon the, a new discipline, unfortunately, is born. The question of data sharing, the different types of reproducibility, which are discussed within the environmental epidemiologist community, and the uncertainty of any scientific uh, investigation, like use measurements. And the, my conclusion is just in the way of Dan Sarevitz, we have always been post normal uh, how large is the phenomenon? It's not most of the scientific uh, uh, research which are false positive. Uh, maybe 20% or if you want a, li a higher point, uh, 30%. This is a paper in biostatistics, one of the leading journals in uh, this field, uh, in which uh, two researchers from Johns Hopkins uh, estimate uh, the extent of irreproducibility in a wider sense. In the discussion, you have uh, Beniamini, who was one of the researchers which most contributed to uh, uh, estimate the, the degree of imprecision in the results. He proposed the so-called false discovery rate as a, a solution and a different approach than using the famous p-value. And he comments that it's not so important to measure accurately this irreproducibility. What is important is to do something because anyway, even if it's 20%, it's too high. But this is not what happened because a new discipline is born. Now we have a Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford who measure repeatedly the extent of irreproducibility and its cause. It's a new scientific discipline which is born with all the inertia of having a new board of academics studying the phenomenon. Uh, the, the point uh, is uh, popular in terms of data sharing. So why the result is not reproduced? Please give me your data let me try to play with them and to reproduce what you have obtained. This is an old issue uh, in uh, computational research. The first part of the slide, the reprodu reproducibility spectrum is a slide of, I think, early 90s in reproducible, uh, in computer science. In computer science, the uh, the paper in a scientific journal means nothing 
means only advertising. The degree of reproducibility is zero. To be fully reproducible, I need to have text, code, data available, which kind of software you use. The software has a lot of updates, so you need the software originally used. So it's much more complex. And take the published paper is only advertising. This is illuminating in one sense. In response to Scott Pruitt, the epid environmental epidemiologist, uh, Roger Peng in Johns Hopkins, uh, Francesca Dominici now in uh, Harvard, published a paper in Criteria for Reproducible Epidemiologic Research. So take seriously this point. On the other, remember what Gelman, the, the, the garden of forking path of Gelman, but it's, it's uh, perfectly understandable that you can analyze the data in a different way and obtain different results. Statistician grows knowing that no model is uh, uh, the true model. There are uh, plenty of models, and you have to discuss comparatively among them. So methodological uh, of result and scientific in uh, Goodman, so the metrics institute in Stanford. Methodological is easy, it's just uh, give me your data and I replicate. My experience in uh, the court, in the trial uh, uh, regarding the largest uh, steel plant of Europe and uh, pollution uh, implied, the, the defense of the industry asked for the data just to try to replicate my consultant report. It expected that they will find very different results. So it's a weak argument to reach reproducibility. Can easily be uh, play, uh, play the, um, the field to play uh, different strategies. Even the research originally uh, suggesting this change idea, they just, just say, oh no, reproducible research can still be wrong. Eh? We, we must do a prevention approach. Prevention in which? Study design. Since the beginning, the, the question, the research question you formulate. Of results, which is strange. Of results is, uh, uh, if I put together all the published report, can I quantify an overall estimate? Can I do a meta-analysis or a, a systematic reviews? But uh, if you look at the problems of the Cochrane collaboration today and the uh, polemics regarding that, it's uh, clear that it's a failure. But look at the strategies, it's very subtle. A new paper in uh, BMJ Open 2016 is a plan for changing the way to report the result of a meta analysis. Incorporate the uncertainty due to the heterogeneity among studies. With a profound misunderstanding of the meaning of a meta analysis. The meaning of a meta-analysis meta is an observational study. If uh, different research produce different results, this is the information. The lack of reproducibility is the information, is healthy science, because give me the idea of why, what is going on. Not to incorporate this extra source of uncertainty in the final decision. This is what Scott Pruitt wants in APA and have less uh, uh, control in, uh, uh, in doing uh, regulations. A scientific uh, reproducibility, Goodman cites uh, William Weevil and the concept of consilience. Uh, Debbie Lohr and George Davis Smith and Kate Tilling in environmental epidemiology uh, spoke about triangulation, different 
study, different study design can uh, give a similar uh, response. But there is no issue. <laughs> this is it's not normal. How you judge a result to be not reproduced? Because you obtain a result, how far from the previous one? How far? You, we have quantification, you, you have to give a number. How far? Two standard deviation, but you are using a normal Gaussian model. But this is not so. <laughs> <laughs> an empirical study of all published paper in different disciplines, nuclear physics up to, to medicine. If a difference would follow the normal law, should be in the dotted lines. But it's completely false, it's not normal. So the difference is expected to be much more than to implicitly are used to think. So it's a no issue. We see a reproducibility problem because we look at it with a wrong glass. First. Second, uncertainty is not solvable. You cannot have a perfect re reproducibility. <laughs> it is not in the reality. And we are of course, we are urged to take action as reported in the history of the International Agency of Research on Cancer, in which they said, in mid-60s, mid-60s, the aim was to develop an instrument capable of evaluating the best evidence available at a given time, like the EPA uh, phrases in the beginning sentences I quoted before. And, of course, we don't have an internal solution for this. Uh, last, uh, the last normal scientist to me was Enrico Fermi. And in the biography uh, published four years ago, to this year in, uh, in Italian, in my mother language, is explained why because he knew everything of physics. And we are not knowing everything of our scientific world. It's industrialized. It's, we have only small pieces of knowledge to be controlled. We cannot apply the same rule. And on the other hand, uh, Enrico Fermi is famous because he never takes position outside his professional commitment. He never commented about politics. He was scientist, isolated from society. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Animale, for this uh, insightful talk. Um, I'm growing more and more frustrated that you cannot ask any question. I was already for the beautiful talk by Dipanwitsa, so as the chair, I decide that if there is like a really small question for Anibale or Dipanwitsa, perhaps we can take it now. If, I mean, only if you're very frustrated. <laughs> no, okay, so, <laughs> so now I welcome uh, Marta Struminska-Kutra. I know she's from Poland, but I forgot the name of the university, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, uh, so what I'm, uh, I'm going to present is on power, as the title says. Uh, and the title is Taking Power Seriously, Practice-Based Considerations on PNS Implementation. Um, where is this? Okay. So um, I will start with a statement. Um, saying that um, actually for me uh, the relationship between evidence-based thank you uh, between evidence-based rationalist approaches to uh, policy uh, to policy making and to the relationship between society and science and versus PNS is like the relationship between two paradigms. So one is fading away, 
and the new paradigm of post-normal science uh, is coming as a new, better frame to interpret science-society relationship. Um, because uh, the new paradigm, post-normal science paradigm, uh, explicitly addresses problems which cannot be solved within traditional approach of evidence-based uh, um, perspective. Uh, these problems are uh, depoliticizing knowledge, ignoring uncertainty and public values, and downplaying the role of democratic deliberation about values in policy making. So uh, what post-normal science uh, is doing, along with uh, another approach is like pragmatic complexity or stakeholder model of science, uh, they diversify the use of scientific knowledge according to the decision-making situation. So if there is complexity and if there is a lack of consensus over values, uh, we uh, can use different roles um, of scientists, different types of academic expertise. Um, they, in this sense, they are the solution uh, to, to above mentioned problems because they acknowledge the value of knowledge while appreciating its limits. Basically by saying we are just scientists, we cannot decide for you people because we are not democratically elected representatives of people. Uh, so we can provide information, we can facilitate a decision-making process, contribute to it, but we cannot uh, deliver truth and the guidance about what needs to be decided. Uh, this approach is offer a way to integrate, uh, integrate science together with democratic deliberation and values. And they offer an alternative conception of science appropriate for the policy process. And um, I think that post-normal science as a framework is in fact a mature framework as a formal construct. Uh, but I think it also needs some um, more considerations about uh, policy making and um, decision making situations, a real life of, uh, of politics in other words. Um, I'm sociologist uh, at the background and I, um, I'm very much interested in uh, philosophy of science, but um, sometimes I feel that I'm, when I'm reading too much of philosophy of science that my, my brain is just you know, doing this bzzz and I cannot do it anymore because it's just too complicated. So I'm then using my experience as a sociologist and I'm trying to observe practice. So at, I reached a point while reading uh, the, the, uh, so the sociology of knowledge or philosophy of science literature when I thought, okay, I need to go back to observation of practice in order to really understand what is it about, what, what are the problems we are talking about here. And uh, what I've, um, the direction I have chosen was Okay, I think we need to open the black box of policy pr making process. Because it's uh, when we are talking on a very abstract level about um, how science can facilitate uh, democratic deliberation, uh, we are treating policy making process as a, as a black box. We are just saying, okay, we are scientists, we jump in and we help with our expertise. But, um, of course, uh, it's, it's not that simple, and nobody says it is simple, but there are not many people, I think, according to my knowledge, who really look into uh, how, how, it, how it works. So the implementation of uh, post-normal science concept would be uh, much easier uh, if decision-making would have taken place in an open, coercion-free, uh, communicative space, so the, the Habermasian uh, notions are, uh, are ringing somewhere here. Um, so this kind of spaces are the spaces where all voices are heard and taken into consideration. In such a space, scientists could then easily facilitate the democratic dialogue. Just the thing is that uh, most of decision-making situation uh, involving uncertainty uh, and conflict over values, so exactly the types of problems uh, PNS is concerned about, uh, are nothing like coercion-free. 
um, communicative spaces. So in, in such situations, knowledge is not used for enlightenment, exploration, experimentation. <coughs> it is used as an ammunition in political battle. If it is so, um, it means for PNS that um, we need to uh, we need to develop some sort of political literacy, some sort of competence about how to deal with uh, uh, with conflict and with uh, entrenched interests and with power struggles. Uh, and this is quite crucial because if we don't don't recognize the role of power asymmetries in uh, democratic processes, in uh, decision-making processes, um, we are, as scientists, uh, exposed uh, to the risk of corruption. Because if we don't see the power asymmetries, we don't, we, we don't know whom we serve. Uh, we don't know what happens with our expertise, whether it will not be abused in order to perpetuate status quo, in order to perpetuate oppression. So I thought, okay, I want to explore this idea um, based on analysis of public, uh, of participatory action research. So there are this, uh, this methodologies which are uh, called, they have different names, but you can call them co-production of knowledge, you can call them uh, cooperative um, methodologies, uh, interactive methodologies. But the basic idea is that scientists are joining uh, those who normally have been subject of research and they are uh, conducting, in conducting inquiry collectively about problems of a given community, about uh, specific problems of uh, social policy. Um, and they are working on uh, asking questions, uh, gathering um, evidence, uh, and then uh, also designing solutions. And um, when uh, looking at these processes, uh, I arrived at the idea that there is some theoretical framework which could be useful to analyze the problems of power uh, in the situations where scientists are involved with lay people in the processes of decision making. Uh, so my idea is that there are three major types of relationships involving power which are significant for PNS um, uh, for PNS practice, as well as for uh, general um, practice involving cooperation of scientists and, and non-academics. So there is a macro level problem. Uh, and there is a, it is a relationship between decision making processes, assuming deliberation, between this co-productive uh, equal processes of dialogue, uh, and its non-deliberative hierarchical context, institutional context, which is far from uh, equal and deliberative. So this is not the way we used to do politics. So now we are jumping in, we are trying this new based on equality, dialogue-like tools, but still we are doing it in a very hostile institutional environment. Uh, here the problem uh, of power is, you, you could call it inertia. We are trying to do something new, we are trying to um, practice new roles as scientists, but we are doing it within old structures. So using the uh, metaphor al already used by, um, by the first speaker, it is like re rebuilding ship which is on the sea. We are trying out something new, but we still are in the old traditional context. So the, the question or the dilemma is how to conduct an equal dialogue between academics and non-academics within the non-dialogical and hierarchical culture and institutional environment. There also is second level or second layer of a problem, a power related problem. It is a meso level uh, and it is, uh, it is a situation of decision making or, or problem solving or research project or this collaborative inquiry. Um, and here the, the power-laden relationship is between actors involved in decision-making process uh, who are not equal in terms of power. 
They have different skills, different competences, different positions, resources in order to even verbalize their interests and their values. Uh, not mentioning about meaningful participation and the bargaining process. Uh, so here the problem is fractality of power. Uh, that power is an inherent feature of social relations. Uh, power relations are fractal, they repeat patterns within itself. It means that they are oppressed among the oppressed groups. Um, the question here is, or the main dilemma is, how to invite and involve those in power into activities which potentially expose domination and are seeking to reduce it. So you are basically uh, in inviting decision makers who have the power to decide on their own, or come share, share your, uh, your capacity to make decisions, share your responsibility to do decision with us. Mm -hmm. And why should they agree? Why should they give up their power and resources? And there is a micro level, individual level, uh, where we can analyze the position of a researcher or academic himself or herself. Here the tension is uh, between uh, an expert and the rest of stakeholders involved in the, pro in the process. And the power related um, uh, characteristic is injection. It means that as a researchers or as academics we are injecting power into the system. We are trying to empower some people who until now were not participating in the processes. So we are in fact executing power. And how we deal with our power position in a responsible way and how we deal with the consequences of our actions. So all of these have in fact ethical, um, ethical dimension. And here the question could be how to be a genuine partner to the stakeholders and simultaneously to adopt a critical stance. Uh, for example, that power asymmetries are part of the problem. Maybe uh, disempowered groups don't perceive themselves as disempowered. Uh, maybe we are imposing the definition on them and because of that we are also executing, executing power. So by looking at the, uh, this uh, collaborative methodologies, I thought that it, is, it might be useful to analyze this problem from the perspective of uh, three um, meta-theoretical um, traditions. One of them is the pragmatist tradition. Uh, saying that, or emphasizing learning from action, the ability of both individuals and communities to improve their knowledge and problem-solving capacity over time. And pragmatic, what pragmatic um, perspective basically says is that humans are willing to learn and experiment and improve practice. Uh, on the other hand, there is the critical tradition who says, well, uh, our knowledge uh, and values and interest, in fact, depends on our social position. So we are, well, okay, we are learning, but we are learning within a, um, a set-up frame. Um, and there is another, um, another tradition in this, this type of, of research, which is constructivist tradition, saying that um, Reality is socially constructed and knowledge is socially constructed. And each of these traditions, uh, they, they stay in uh, tensions between each other. Um, and this is, I will, I will uh, show you how these tensions work and how in fact they can, uh, they can be useful uh, for, uh, for us as academics to maneuver between the dilemmas uh, and tensions connected to um, to our existence in politics and policy making. So the first tension uh, is um, conceptuali uh, conceptualizing science policy re relationship as a collective inquiry, uh, which confronts dominant non-dialogical discourses, hierarchical modes of governance within private and public spaces. So PNS makes the pragmatist assumption about human willingness to experiment and learn but it functions in an institutional environment which is still dominated by the linear model. Uh, and the problem is that people whom we invite uh, to this uh, dialogical process are often very confused with the fact the the, that the academic is taking this democratic role. And they don't really want to participate in it because they think, uh, 
it's not it's not the way you should act as an academic as a researcher you cannot ask me what is what i think is the problem you should know the problem um and on the other hand, of course, it's a structural issue that academic institutions uphold the linear model uh, because they search for resources. And this is the model which is legitim legitimized model. So in order to get resources from politicians, they need to uh, provide evidence. Um, so um, if, we, uh, if this new uh, roles are suppressed by, by old structure, we can arrive at the situation where deliberation is a facade. And we are, in fact, supporting the facade. And so we are uh, facing opportunism. So we need this critical angle uh, saying that uh, we question these institutional arrangements openly. So we need to perform institutional work as academics in order to show that this is not the only possible way to, to do things in science society relationship. Uh, there is second tension. Uh, it is about this organi organization of uh, deliberative decision making processes uh, without really resolving power asymmetries. So the, the challenge here is that we would like to be neutral um, providers of knowledge, but um, how can we deal with power asymmetries in, the, in this dialogue-like situation? Um, because if we see that there are weaker parties, shall we then support them uh, and ask them to step out and to tell more? Uh, should we encourage them? Then we lose neutrality in the uh, face of, uh, of those of other actors uh, involved. Um, but we need the other actors. We need the powerful on the board because they are uh, in power to change the structures. Uh, so um, in this sense, uh, we are being pragmatist. We are inviting them. So we are tempering our radicalism in order to arrive at change, in order to not uh, lo lose a chance for, uh, for change. Um, and this is an important point that when we enter this kind of decision-making situations as uh, post-normal scholars, we need to be supported by someone uh, who facilitates the power relationships in a group with whom we are working. It needs a lot of facilitation and mediation between conflicting interests. And the uh, third tension, balancing between um, a genuine partner and own power position. So just quickly, um, um, how to capture it quickly. And so, of course, quite complicated situation because this is the situation where the constructivist perspective steps in. Um, when facilitating the decision-making process or when communicating knowledge, academics are inevitably enacting power. It is more or less conscious enactment of power uh, because we are selective. We need to be selective. We never can tell anything everything. We are using words which are the frames of interpretation and uh, this in, turns, uh, in turn influence the perception of interest. It sets the agenda. So how we deal with this problem? To what extent does this facilitation impose the researcher's conception of the best interest of the parties involved? Um, so here is the risk of paternalism. How can we answer it? We can answer it by exploring local knowledge and experiences. But what it can happen that domination is not a problem for people involved. Uh, and here we arrive at a very important problem, whether we as researchers are able to accept um, sensitivities which are uh, strange for us. Uh, whether we are um, able to, for example, endorse conservative sensitivity or Republican uh, sensitivity, whether we are able to open ourselves for a dialogue. And then the question is, how far can we go with it? Because then again, our constructivism, uh, constructivism, constructivist intention to endorse all perspectives needs to stop somewhere because we are at risk of relativism. So when do we say, okay, that's it. Well, that's the question, and this is the pragmatist answer, saying we have our own expertise, 
and we are in, uh, how is it the expression, in law, in right, to express it, because we are just part of a dialogue. Um, and in this sense, the answer is that we uh, should make our agency, our values, our goals, uh, transparent and open for negotiation. And interestingly, in many of these processes, we are not able to, as researchers, openly say, okay, we are here to enhance democratic process. We are here to enhance the social justice. It's our hidden agenda we, are, we believe in, but we are not able to open for a discussion, actually. So that's, um, and this all I, I've, uh, I've observed in, uh, um, in this participatory, uh, participatory processes. And just to end up with a sort of a conclusion, um, so my, my idea was that by using all these three perspectives, uh, pragmatist, constructivist, and critical one, uh, in a constant dialogue, we can escape the tensions. It does not mean we resolve them, but we were basically running in circles, failing and finding a solution and failing again, but uh, running away from failure into another failure. Um, so I think it's better than nothing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. So I'm Nicola Campini, and uh, I'm presenting today a work, uh, a piece of work that I've worked on for a couple of years, uh, with, together with David Tera, who's uh, a ph philosopher of science working in Madrid. Um, and it is about basically the potential for digital platforms to give rise to a set of uh, interferences with the regime of clinical trials of drug regulation. Yeah, okay. Um, so before, you know, because I'm going to try to pack many things, uh, but this is of course not a defense of the status quo, and it is a set of open questions. It, it is for us a piece where we open up a discussion with, about problems that we don't really know how to solve. Um, Okay, so the issue is then, could patient activity coordinated over digital platforms challenge current drug testing standards and regimes of medical experimentation? Um, just a recap, of course, uh, double-blind randomized clinical trials are used as the regulatory yardstick in order to approve markets and, and uh, approve drugs to market. Um, they are comparative experiments and, of course, the blinding device, so the patients not knowing whether they're in treatment or in control, and the clinicians knowing who, not knowing who's on what, are considered to be a very strong uh, methodological precaution in order to um, inhibit the interferences, the biases that could be introduced by people being able to exercise their preferences. It is not a mystery. Um, um, through a lot of empirical research that uh, people have preferences when they engage in clinical trials even when they are willing to put them aside as much as possible. And the preference usually for a patient that has a particular kind of condition is to be on the clinical trial because the chances of getting an experimental drug are, might be better than getting the best of available drugs. Um, so, of course, is what's important to focus here is the idea that the RCT protocol, with its blinding uh, mechanism, is the locus of control that allows the social contract of the uh, um, clinical trial to be enforced. So that means that then trial design is effective only as long as protocol can be enforced. If it cannot be perfectly enforced, interferences can occur. And the interference is fatal is the protocol is subverted and the experiment cannot continue. One important historical antecedent, for instance, were the uh, gay rights activists uh, trying to uh, coalesce and uh, uh, sabotage uh, experimentation during the search for HIV uh, med you know, medications. Um, Non-fatal um, interferences can still matter because they can introduce, of course, bias, which can, um, for instance, induce the regulator to refuse to approve a market and ask a retrial. So, um, basically, the warning here uh, is basically that uh, group coordination was very difficult in a pre-digital era, for instance, in the case of the anti-retroviral anti drugs um, that I just mentioned, it had to build 
uh, on pre-existing networks, in this case, gay rights activists. Um, but in the digital era, we have very powerful uh, tools that allow very flexible organization and could be used um, by people in order to subvert the, the running of a trial. Um, so the problem is then the existing social contract in medical experimentation it might be changing because of lack of enforcement. And then the question is, so when these, what is the best available solution if we, we lose this kind of standard? Since 2011, I've uh, uh, started this network. I, con I conducted an embedded organizational ethnography within the network. Um, and I was there uh, doing this study while some important events were happening, important for this paper. So 600,000 patients, 3,000 uh, 3, conditions, people aggregating data, sharing health data about their health condition. Um, how it's run, no advertisements, but it, rather sale of market research, research services to pharmaceutical companies and insurance, health plans, and so on. Profiles. Uh, um, you know, quality of life measurements, um, patient reported outcome measures, uh, subjective measurements of, um, you know, well-being, um, dosage and um, treatment regime, uh, symptoms and severity, they cannot be tracked and they become, uh, you know, standard data for making various kinds of analysis. And then a system that uh, automatically and dynamically computes reports about all sorts of symptoms, the treatments that are associated to, and of course facilitates then the interaction uh, between patients based on the data points that are shared. So forum, link, forum links, um, links to other patients suffering from the same symptom and so on. So here's the story about uh, um, um, a trial. And it's a story that is, that is already widely available in the sense that people have, uh, that some of the directly involved have published about it and that, that I corroborate with other observations and, and data from my direct involvement in the company while um, I was there. So it's set in the ALS community, of course, it's a, it's a famous kind of uh, uh, community because it's very active um, in, um, in um, you know, patient activism. Uh, it's also very active in self-experimentation, and it's considered orphan, orphan disease because it's very rare, so the amount of patients is small. Um, it's a small market. And uh, it's a very rare and incurable disease, this so-called death, death sentence, two, five years life expectancy since technologies. So there's a drug that has been uh, trialed and is still um, being trialed by a small bio company in California. And um, it's basically what it's testing is a highly purified pH adjusted stabilized form of sodium chloride, form, form of sodium chloride, um, which has been already approved in other countries like Thailand for other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, it's, it, it needs delivered intravenously. Two trials between 2010 and 2012, of course, phase one and phase two. So one actor enters the frame here who's a patient activist who's participated in previous self-experimentation experiments in the, uh, on the web, on, uh, in this case about lithium carbonate, is Eric Fowler. And um, he's ineligible because he's bed bound, he's in life support, so he can, he's not healthy enough to be a participant. But he does his own research and has a, a hypothesis that what the trial is uh, experimenting with is sodium chloride, is a form of highly refined sodium chloride. So uh, he announces it on his blog and he starts to experiment with sodium chloride because it can be easily sourced at industrial grade. It's used to clean swimming pools and or water treatment plants. So it's easy and cheap to find and uh, he makes up a, a protocol for taking this uh, uh, chemical compound uh, orally as a solution and that you can drink. Of course, it's different than from what the trial is experimenting with, which is intravenous. Then uh, there's a second uh, um, trial, of course, that starts and is obviously also ineligible. Uh, so he launches a ALS chloride project using Google Sites and uh, he invites people to participate, other ALS patients, to find out if the sodium chloride oral solution uh, can work. Um, it might work just as well as uh, the NP001 might be working. Um, so he's got N above 20, which is 
not an incredibly uh, unspeakably small number in ALS studies because it's so rare. And there's some duplicate reporting also going on on patients like me. And um, the stakes are, of course, very high. And what uh, he's intended to is, as he says, we have no delusion that anything we're doing is intended to replace clinical trials. Rather, we intend to augment and push forward the actual science. Um, he, um, he says, of course, we can use technology to organize and mobilize. And we're capable of learning and comprehending complicated concepts. And he's trying to do a very serious job at trying to be as scientific as possible according to uh, inheriting the you know, received models of uh, what a good experimentation is like. There's another patient that enters the frame at the time of the second trial, the phase two trial. And he's, however, enrolled in the trial. So he's, he's taking something, either placebo or the experimental drug, starts reporting on patients like me, and starts to um, invite other patients who are on the trial to say it and to report their symptoms so that maybe they can reproduce who's on the trial arm and who's not and find out if the drug is actually working or not. And it gets 34 people, which is about one-third of the actual trial enrollment. So. Um, Amblines his own trial treatment by uh, searching in the clinic and doing a little, going a bit, uh, say, say off-piste. He experiences reversals. He procures himself the oral solution intake after the trial treatment uh, and before the trial protocol ends, so while he's still within observation. So a number of, say, violations of the trial protocol, if you want. And contacts the patients like me staff to try to collaborate. Self-reported outcomes of homebrew sodium chloride so look a little bit uh, promising because there are reversals, but then at the same time, caution is needed because reversals in ALS are common and they just don't last in, in time, time tells. And there's a third actor who enters the frame who's also in the, in the, in the trial. And uh, he's a physicist, devises a way to produce an intravenous solution of the sodium chloride, so sourced in the same way as industrial cleaner and then reworked and in, he injects himself um, after trial and to extend the duration of, of the effects. Um, he ponders leaving on protocol. Uh, both the last two, Ben Harris and Rob Tyson, um, are disappointed after the effects wane and about uh, uh, one year after the trial the first and one year after the one of the, they both basically decide to starve um, and, and die. Patients like me, they are contacted by, uh, by persevering, Rob Tyson, okay. And they have concerns about the method because, of course, it's not uh, a very solid way of uh, reaching a conclusion. There are several discussions and meetings that uh, ensue, and are there ways not to leave them in the dark without damaging the, the trial? And there are, of course, ethical and liability, uh, illegal liabilities that are potential. Yeah. There is, of course, also an underlying conflict of interest because supporting patient communication and learning is a main value proposition. You don't want to alienate your best champions. And there is an empathic dimension, of course. They have a sense of urgency that we cannot understand. They want to know how each other are doing. So what they do is they wait until the end of the phase two trial and they release an analysis via fixture about the oral solution sodium chloride and MP001. So here we have a lot of movement, right? One trial four different initiatives and three different compounds, diff producing different data for different targets. Five analyses, well, the ACP is inconclusive because uh, most of the uh, participating patients abandon while, while, when they make up their mind that the oral solution is not working. Persevering reports uh, major effectiveness, but in a statistically non significant way. Patients that me analysis actually warns the oral solution is harming people, and uh, there, it, but there might be a no significant positive correlation with the experimental drug, according to the self-identification. And then there are, of course, the two published studies of the company. Um, so around one, tri one trial match action, enabled by web-based networks, and many possible harms or wrongs, trial can be put at risk with dropout and heavily biased. Patients can harm themselves and others with unsafe concoctions. So what's the future of clinical trials? 
The problem is without a dr new drug testing standard that both accommodates patient preferences without bias and uh, the eventual proliferation of patient initiatives online may weaken the, the even further the reliability of the RCT regime without a clear long-term benefit for the patients involved. Risk is to generate a situation where we have lots of evidence that it is of bad quality. There are new conflicts of interest then because uh, patients like me or any other network that can be used for the same purpose, it be Twitter or Google, these uh, so-called, we're just a tech, net, a tech company, um, have of course a, a different kind of uh, bias and interest in facilitating these kind of actions. Um, in particular, patients like me is trying to sell research services to pharmaceutical companies and has been trying to uh, find ways in which, you know, these networks can be used for phase four post uh, approval, uh, you know, surveillance and, and so on. So, you know, a different kind of conflict of interest also between tech companies and, uh, you know, third party market research companies. Digital platforms, um, then again, as enablers of uh, these kind of emergent initiatives, um, that can um, uh, arise in the absence of a mandate of an activist organization, evolve very quickly, multiply, cross over, and generate self-experimentation activity that does, does not always leave a conclusive data trail. So may the Jenny out, be out of the bottle here. I try to think also, I'm, I'm new to the discussion of the post-normal science uh, community, but um, there are, of course, some interesting questions, I think, there. Um, so what, do, what to do if this complementary science that is purported to be complementary interferes with the applied science? How to construct a new social contract that can allow us to work within the constraints of empowered participants' conditional altruism? What about new evidential standards? How to separate the extended facts from the potential harm? And in the end, how should we regulate drugs? Um, this paper is, uh, is in press in, a, in Economy and Society, so hopefully it will be available very soon. Uh, thank you. Um.